Well, I have to say it's a pleasure to be here. I've heard such great things about Waterloo for, well, so many years, and um, it's, it's fun to see old friends, worst belief, I shouldn't say old, existing, <laughs> existing friends and colleagues and meet new people, and I heard a great series of kind of lightning talks from the eco-hydrology group today. So thank you for inviting me and, and welcoming here. And um, I'm going to talk about some of the work in, in my group, which has really been focused on in the last, well, probably 15, 20 years in developing geophysical methods to understand how, um, it used to be mostly how subsurface systems function, but as we're um, also really trying to understand terrestrial environments in the context of climate change. Um, we also are working really from bedrock to canopy and using geophysical methods. And um, I'd like to recognize some of my colleagues uh, shown there that are working closely with me in this geophysical group. And I also mentioned two different teams here. You'll recognize that kind of our, our group's geophysical work is done in the context of a couple big projects. And so I'll mention these projects to you, but um, it's a really important part of advancing our science is trying to interface with our biology colleagues, our geochemistry, our climate colleagues, and so forth. So what I thought I'd do is start out very simply. Um, what is the motivation for really trying to understand terrestrial um, ecosystems and watersheds? And I'm sure this is you know, really um, rudimentary for many of you. You're living this and you know this, but I wanted to kind of start out at a high level. Um, then I'll spend a few moments talking about this geophysical work, hydrogeophysics in particular, and just give a very brief overview of that. I won't dig deeply into any of the methodologies that we've used to kind of develop these geophysical methods to quantify these systems. Um, I'll spend a few moments talking about the two different field study sites where I'll be giving some examples. One's in the Arctic, up in the Barrow, Alaska, um, and moving to other parts of, of Alaska, but really looking at high latitude permafrost systems. And another one's at the Headwater River uh, catchment in the Colorado River Basin. So, so two different types of systems where we're trying to develop our methods. Um, and then what I really want to get across to you are two different um, methods that we are developing kind of moving a little bit away from the sort of hydrogeophysical work we've been doing in the last decade or so to try and develop ways of really integrating different types of data that sample different properties over different support scales and give kind of a holistic picture of these different environments and how they're behaving as they're being threatened by a variety of perturbations. Um, and so I'll talk in one, in one, in the Arctic case study, for example, you know, there's short-term perturbations in terms of freeze cycle, but then of course there's the longer-term perturbation of warming and permafrost thaw. And in the uh, Colorado River Basin, we'll be looking at perturbations of things like floods and droughts and episodic weather events and so forth. And I won't spend a lot of, bit of, a lot of time on that, but really this is the, the direction of our research. So starting at a very, very simple high level, um, you know, why are we interested in understanding, uh, from our perspective, uh, ecosystem science and, and particularly um, some of the permafrost work that we're doing? And it really has to do with a carbon cycle. And this, of course, has carbon cycle 1.0 and it shows the kind of current magnitude of different fluxes across different parts of our Earth system. But, you know, if you think of carbon cycle 0.0, basically before uh, the Industrial Revolution when our system was in balance in terms of a carbon cycle. Of course, we'll have, you know, occasional spurts of CO2 from volcanoes and other things, but in general, what was put into the atmosphere was taken up by different parts of our Earth system. And of course, that has changed as we're in the Industrial Revolution, and a lot of that older carbon that was buried down in geological reservoirs has been brought up and we use it for combustion. And what's, of course, turned out, as we all know, is that we have this buildup of, of carbon in the atmosphere. Um, and so we are out of balance, um, but you can see by this figure that there are still, the Earth plays a pretty large role in taking up a lot of this carbon. And so both the terrestrial environment, the land sink, and the ocean sink play a pretty big role still in taking up carbon. And that's an important thing. And really there's a vulnerability there. That's at the heart of the, the work I'm going to talk about. Of course, what's happening as that CO2 is building up in our atmosphere is that the UV light that's coming in is being trapped. We're getting a warming or greenhouse effect and we're having uh, temperatures go up. I think we're all quite familiar with this. But it is interesting to think about as we project forward what will CO2 look like in the atmosphere and how will that land and ocean continue to take up that CO2. You know, a big uncertainty really is what is the role of these land systems in continuing to serve as a large carbon sink? Uh, 
And I'm sure you've all seen these plots, particularly this one showing CO2 going up over time. We're looking out to the end of this century. Each of these lines basically show a different, um, yeah, a different type of model that has different processes, different parameterizations, but basically different types of IPCC models. This one shows the projections that the oceans are going to take up CO2 over time, and this one shows the role of the land or the terrestrial ecosystems. And what's pretty surprising, I think, to, to some is that uh, we are at a pretty early stage in understanding how that terrestrial environment will continue to function throughout this 21st century. Will it serve as a sink and continue to provide that great service it does for our Earth? Or will it actually give off carbon? And some predict one way and some predict the other. And the bottom line is here that we really just don't know how terrestrial systems will continue to function through the end of this century. So that's a little bit of the motivation for the ecosystem work and particularly the Arctic work that I'm going to talk about today. And I think I've heard a lot of great lightning talks this morning that were really pointed in this direction. The other thing that we're interested in is not just with climate change, how ecosystems will feed back to climate, but we're very interested in understanding how will changes in climate and associated attributes, early snow melt, floods and droughts, um, you know, extreme weather, how does that influence the way watersheds function and the way watersheds deliver uh, water and nutrients and even contaminants down gradient along lateral, um, along lateral gradients? And so this is also a very difficult question um, and so something that we're focusing on and really the, the point of our, our um, Colorado River Shed study that I'll talk about in, in a little bit during this, this presentation. But so basically, trying to understand ecosystem feedbacks to climate, trying to understand climate influences on how a watershed functions. Um, and so I think we're all recognizing more and more that this is not a simple thing to do. Um, a lot of the uh, processes of a variety of biogeochemical cycles in the environment are microbially mediated. So we have to understand the biological component and how that biology plays out in a very heterogeneous template, a very dynamic template of our Earth. At the same time, we have to think about bringing some of our climate scales models, you know, basically down to scales where they can start interfacing with a watershed and really provide realistic information about precipitation and temperature. So what I'm going to talk about today is the use of geophysics to try and help to start bridge across some of these scales. Of course, you know, it's by, by no means um, a silver bullet. It's one of the pieces in the arsenal that we have to start understanding our connected system across these different space and time scales. <clears throat> and I'm going to try and get at both today trying to use geophysics to look at the structure um, of these uh, watersheds and ecosystems as well as to look at the functioning or how they're changing over time in response to a perturbation. I'm going to talk about two different large um, team-based projects. So I'm at Berkeley Lab, as, as, as we heard, and um, we're primarily funded by Department of Energy. Tons to fund very large kind of team-based projects where there's a lot of uh, iterations between experiments, observations, and modeling, very much driven by developing predictive frameworks. Um, and so we're collecting a lot of neat data, developing new models, challenging these models with data. And we have two different projects that I'm quite involved in. I'm the, I'm the lead of this project. We call it Genomes to Watershed, where we're really trying to understand, you know, the, the, from the fundamental biology, how it um, cycles some of the biogeochemistry, how it changes with environmental stress, what this means for biogeochemical cycling, and really trying to develop models that can help us to scale from that very fundamental biology out to the larger system scale and understand does it make a difference if we have that very mechanistic data. And so that's genomes to watershed. And on the other hand, we have another project called Next Generation Ecosystem Experiment, or NG Arctic. Um, and this one's taken it now, not genomes to watershed, but from watershed or ecosystem up to climate. And so I'll speak about both of these. Um, but they are, you know, really kind of driven by where we are in the state of science and that we have very little um, in terms of computational tools that will take us across the scales uh, that we really need, and we're still at a pretty early stage at understanding how much is enough, what do we need where, when do we need it, and so forth. And, and so DOE recognizes this. These are pretty large projects. This one, for example, is multi-institutional, um, about $10 million a year for 10 years, so a $100 million project that DOE has invested to try and get at some of these very big questions, such as will the vulnerable Arctic ecosystem remain a carbon sink through the 21st century? <clears throat> 
So um, I wanted to say just a little bit about the methods we're using. And um, again, I won't spend too much detail talking about the geophysics. Tony, you're here. We have a you know, great geophysics group in, in this institution also, so I'm sure many of you are very familiar with this. But I think it's worth saying that we've learned in the last decade or so, too, maybe, that um, geophysics can really provide a lot of great information about our critical zone or, or the near subsurface. Um, but that there's quite a bit of work to do from taking a geophysical signature as we measure it in the field into something that's useful for our studies, right? What we measure are things like electrical conductivity or dielectric constant or seismic velocity. And there's a lot of work to do to take that geophysical signature into something that we can use to understand uh, state stocks, flows, residence times, reactions in a, in a heterogeneous template. Um, geophysics are also really nice, of course, that they measure or they can provide information really spatially distributed um, and non-invasively or minimally invasively often, but they're also uh, indirect. They don't measure exactly what we want, as I just said. So there's a lot of work to do to kind of translate it from our measurement to our useful information. And, you know, there's several components that we typically use to get it from A to B. One is, first of all, collecting the right kind of data for our target of interest, and this is where geophysicists, you know, will really have a good idea about what the sensitivity is of a different geophysical attribute to a, um, an imaging or monitoring target at hand. Another important component is what we call petrophysical relationships. So these are relationships that link that geophysical observable say, uh, electrical connectivity to a property that we're interested in, say, water content or salinity. Um, and these can be developed in the laboratory. They can be developed by using co-located field measurements. They can be extracted from theory, you know, but they're an important part um, of the process. And then finally, where I spend, tend to spend a lot of my time is um, the inversion, uh, uh, often joint inversion or an integration approaches. So as I said earlier, you know, we have lots of different types of data that are measuring and monitoring these systems from these geophysics to point measurements, some above ground, some below ground. How do we integrate these in a way that, you know, kind of honors their sensitivity, their spatial resolution, and gives us a holistic picture of the subsurface? So there's been a lot of advances in hydrogeophysics in many groups in the last 10, 15 years or so in really improving our understanding. Um, and I think one of the things that's been quite powerful in particular is using geophysics in a time-lapse sense. Um, and so, of course, a time-lapse sense means that you're collecting data at the same point uh, in the same spatial location over time. And as the system particularly is dynamic with fluid moving through it, changes in geochemistry, whatnot, I mean, you kind of, by that, you can difference these data, remove the geology, and have the geophysics really image what's going on. Very similar to medical imaging of your body as you see a trace or test move through, right? You can actually see this move through the system and it's been very helpful. It's been used quite a bit um, for monitoring moisture, uh, some cases for plume movement, but some cases we can actually even pull together different types of information to estimate uh, some microbially mediated processes like I'm showing here. This is just an example of using time-lapse spectral-induced polarization to actually estimate things like um, iron-2 concentration. This is a little cross-section over time. And we can see in a lot of this sort of work that we've done in comparison or in conjunction with remediation-based technologies where we are perturbing the biogeochemistry, that the geophysics really provides great information about how very complex biogeochemical reactions are happening in the context of a, of a structured uh, material. So that's all I really wanted to say about geophysics in terms of the methodology. Again, I'm not going to uh, um, dig into it too much. Um, I want to turn to some examples of how we've used these data in the two different systems, starting with the Arctic system. So why are we working in the Arctic system? I think actually many of you are working in high latitude systems and you, and you know this, um, but that this is a system that contains a huge amount of organic carbon that's locked up in the permafrost. Um, you know, you, I think most of you know that plants live and they die and oftentimes that organic carbon gets degraded very rapidly um, in more temperate environments. In the Arctic, it's, you know, very slow degradation. And so this, this uh, organic material gets buried in the permafrost. Um, and so we're looking at, you know, a picture of the permafrost here. It's a big part of our Earth. And permafrost soils store almost as much organic carbon in soils in the rest of the world and more than twice as much as is currently in the atmosphere. And of course, the worry is that there's a, you know, Arctic temperatures are changing very rapidly, more rapidly than any place in the world. 
um, and that as this permafrost thaws, that there could be a huge propensity to release a lot of this carbon into the atmosphere. And so um, this happens, of course, by microbial decomposition of this organic matter in the subsurface. And here we're looking at a very simplified cross-section of um, a permafrost type of environment, very local scale, uh, but it could be extended to larger scales where we have permafrost. Permafrost, I'm sure everybody here knows, is, you know, a, a, it's, a, it's ground that's frozen for two or more consecutive years. But on top of that, we have what's called an active layer, this little layer here. And this is a, you know, typically a half a meter or less, a part of the earth that freezes and thaws each year. Um, and when it thaws, uh, then the conditions are right for the microbial community in that layer to degrade that organic carbon, using it as a carbon source, basically, and respiring both CO2 and methane to the atmosphere. And of course, you know, the concern is that with warming, and the projections are that it'll really continue to warm, there'll be a lot of permafrost thaw, there'll be a lo much larger active layer, and these microbes will be exposed to, you know, potentially very bioavailable organic carbon, and we could see this huge pulse to the atmosphere. Um, on the other hand, what happens um, when it, when it um, warms up, uh, we can also get a couple different things. We can get plant growth. Plant growth can take up CO2. Um, and we also get changes in what the land surface looks like. So changes in vegetation, changes in albedo due to uh, uh, changes in land cover, snow versus water, for example. So really, um, from my perspective, and I think from many perspectives, this is a real tipping point question that we really just don't understand. The Arctic is one of these huge vulnerable um, land, land systems similar to the tropics, probably uh, the other most vulnerable um, ecosystem on the Earth, the tropic, most of the biomass is an above ground vegetation. In the Arctic, most of the you know, carbon is below ground locked up. So two systems where we really need to understand what's going to go on in the next you know, coming decades to help us understand where our climate system will be. Why is that so hard? <laughs> um, I mean, for all of us, I think that work in natural systems recognize that there's a huge range of not only scale, but process complexity. Um, that happens in these systems. And so, you know, th thinking that this organic carbon is degraded by microbes that are sitting inside of soil aggregates, like I'm showing here, and that the models that are actually projecting um, what climate will look like in years to come have pixel sizes that are on the order of 30 kilometer by 30 kilometer is quite astounding. So it is a grand challenge to think about how to scale or do we need to scale um, processes that are happening at their native scale up to the scale where we can start to really simulate and parameterize climate models. And what we're looking at here is an um, Arctic soil aggregate from one of my field study sites in Barrow, and now we're digging in from a microbes perspective into this soil grain. And you can imagine that carbon sitting in one point and, and water might be distributed in another part of this aggregate, and the way for this you know, organism to actually carry out its metabolic function needs the coincidence of all of these to actually um, perform that respiration process. Process. So it's, you know, these are the processes where scales are happening, and yet when we go out to the field, we have much different scales where we're doing our research. What I'm going to do in this is now take us from the scale of that microbial perspective of the carbon world up to the scales where we are doing our measurements, and then finally up to the scales where climate models are measuring it to kind of set the stage for the challenge that we are trying to, uh, you know, approach in these two topics. So, what I'm going to show you here is this land surface in this um, ice wedge polygon region in Barrow, Alaska, where we've been working the last few years. And we're looking at the very local scale where a lot of us do work. So we can see these ice wedge polygons. And, and, um, and, uh, and each of the subsequent figures, basically, this figure will be encapsulated within the yellow box on the next one. So this is a region that has this very low topography and gradient. There's ice wedge polygons. There's drain thaw lake basins. You know, water is distributed on the land surface. The conceptual model of our project was that um, as permafrost degrades, it'll change that microtopography, which in turn will change the distribution of water, which in turn will change the above ground biology, the vegetation, and the below ground biology because it'll influence redox. Um, and so here we're stepping away from land surface, still working at kind of scales we, we typically do in the field, now stepping out to landscape scales, and you see that the ice wedge polygons kind of recede to the background, and what you see come forward is the other main geomorphic feature, which are these uh, fall lake basins. And then finally, we move out to scales where climate models are really working, and this is the Barrow Peninsula, the northernmost city in, 
in our town, really, in the US, um, in the Arctic, very cold, continuous permafrost. And imagine that we have to take what we understand about the, that microbe that I showed you on the last slide, how it's influenced by variable vegetation, redox, microtopography, hydrology, geochemistry happening around these meter sort of length scale. How do we really parameterize models that are working up at this scale, and do we need to? Um, so that's a real big challenge, and of course, it's not just the spatial scale challenge and the heterogeneity, it's that the processes are extremely complex. And here, I've just thrown up a few different types of uh, reaction networks um, that are looking at different compartments of this system. So for example, this, um, this kind of schematic interaction is talking about how permafrost degradation influences water distribution, um, which influences vegetation. Uh, this is speaking, which is probably too hard to see, but how um, soil methane production is a function of hydrology and geochemistry. The one on the upper left side is associated with um, our project in the uh, Colorado River Basin where, you know, we see different microbial communities um, mediating different types of reactions. So very complicated process. Um, how are we going about studying this? Uh, we're only in a few years into this uh, next generation ecosystem experiment Department of Energy project, but we have a big team. My role's team is to really look at the, uh, the heterogeneity and some of the scaling aspects and see, you know, try and understand how we can represent these systems uh, using a variety of different types of measurements. Geophysics is, you know, really my, my, my main tool, um, but we also use a lot of stochastic methods to pull things together. And we start by collecting very nested scale experiments where, you know, we're really wanting to move up to these sort of scales and parameterize our pixels, but we're really coming all the way down to these scales to understand what's going on as a function of the microtopography, as a function of the more local scales, and as a function of the more regional scales. Um, and as I mentioned, I, I w just wanted to say a little bit more, we're working in this environment um, called uh, the Ice Wedge Polygon sort of environment. So um, probably many of you are familiar with this, but of course ground freezes and thaws, and as it uh, freezes, it, it can crack and water can get into that, forming these ice wedges. Um, and the ice wedges kind of bump up the land around it, so form you know, this sort of very microtopography here. But in some t cases, these ice wedges, when it gets warmer, they thaw and, they, and the ground collapses, so you get basically troughs and peaks. And there's been a fair amount of work, mm, some work, that has really focused on trying to understand how peaks, troughs, and rims of these individual polygons might influence the biology or the geochemistry. Um, but really not a lot that's looking at ice wedge polygon landforms um, as a whole and tried to think about how to scale it up to larger model, model appropriate um, parameterizations. So we start very small. Um, of course, we start, we work with our microbiology colleagues that are working much smaller than this, but we, you know, pull a lot of holes um, from the ground, bring back cores, we kind of CT scan all of our cores, we try and understand from that the vertical distribution of things like mineral soils and ice and, and water and so forth. We actually use a variety of different energies of um, CT scan to really try to estimate in the vertical dimensions things that we care about like organic fraction. These are very useful for constraining some of the larger geophysics that I'll show you, but it provides really nice information about our vertical heterogeneity at a few places. Um, actually, we have about 100 cores from this site. We take these cores and we do a fair amount of, of laboratory studies, and again, I'm just going to really skim the surface and show you some of the things we're doing, and this is an example of just doing freeze-thaw experiments to understand um, water distribution and, the, and oops, sorry, um, the formation of, of, uh, of basically these, we see a lot of saline striations, we see monolayers around here, and so we're really trying to understand and work with our microbiology colleagues to understand what this real system looks like as it freeze-thaw, and where uh, might the microbes be able to sustain life during uh, winter time by uh, sitting in pockets of, of water, and particularly saline-rich water. We've done an awful lot of geophysics, and I'm not going to spend too much time going into the details, but from electrical to seismic to radar uh, to induce polarization, we collect a lot of point measurements, and so this is just an example. We are collecting data, you know, from the ground surface, from, from the air, 
um, constrained by a lot of point measurements. It's been real fun, um, and I have to say the data are astonishingly beautiful from this site for some particular reason. Um, and we collect data over various times during the year. So as, as I'll mention, we have a lot of data sets that are now streaming autonomously, measuring below ground and above ground at the same time, but we also go out at certain times during the year. I mentioned at the beginning of this presentation that we're interested in um, how systems are responding to perturbations. And some of those are real longer term perturbations. We're looking at both press and pulse perturbations. So here, this is such an extremely dynamic environment. Um, you know, we get a really hard cold winter, we get thaw where snow melt um, rushes along the ground surface when it thaws, then we get a grow very pretty short growing season and we get a freeze up again. And so we've been collecting data throughout the year, some subset is autonomous, um, but also taking some big campaigns where we're collecting all of that geochemistry, hydrology, biology together with our geophysics. So what I wanted to do now is just show you a few examples of that data. Um, and I'm going to start by showing you some of the more, I think, what I would say is the kind of more traditional approaches that we've been using in the past and using a particular type of geophysical method to estimate a particular component or parameter associated with a system. Um, so for example, we'll take a look at estimation of, of snow at the land surface. We'll take a, a look at some use of geophysics for estimating some of this active layer and the properties that are important for microbial respiration in this active layer, such as moisture, temperature. We'll take a look at some of the permafrost characterization using geophysics. Um, but you know what I really want to spend time on and what I'm really most excited about are moving beyond these one method, one parameter sort of estimation approaches to really combine a variety of different data to get a sense of how the system is functioning and are there different parts of the landscape that are functioning in different ways relevant to the challenge at hand and here we're interested on this project in carbon cycling. Okay, so let's look at some of the kind of more traditional approaches. This is an example of using ground penetrating radar to estimate snow. Ground penetrating radar is actually, you know, pull, you can, this is actually me pulling it along in two little antennas. It's sending a wave into the ground and bouncing back up at the base of the snow, the top of the land. A very simple way to try and estimate snow thickness. We're es trying to also estimate things like snow water equivalent, soil water, snow water equivalent. Um, but we can get a lot of good information about snow thickness, and snow is important because it's a thermal insulator, um, for one, and it can really uh, make a difference in terms of its spatial variability and how long the active layer uh, stays unfrozen, how deep it is, and the microbial respiration there. But it's also an important part for spring runoff, right? If you have more snow in one place, you'll get more runoff come spring, and so we want to know that to parameterize the models. This is an example of using uh, ground penetrating radar based estimates of snow thickness compared to point measurements. And so you can see we can do a very great job. This is an example over um, maybe about a kilometer by kilometer block in one of our study regions in the Arctic showing uh, point measurements extracted from, you know, just measuring uh, the traditional ways, measuring snow by a little point probe. Um, if we add ground penetrating radar to that, we can get much more dense data. And if we do a stochastic combination of um, LIDAR based measurements, which tells about microtopography and ground penetrating radar data, we can kind of fill up that whole site and estimate um, uh, snow thickness very, very well. So just one example. Um, we've used electrical methods to tell us quite a bit, actually, about active layer properties as well as permafrost properties. So electrical methods basically send a current into the ground. We measure um, potential difference at two other places, and from that we, can in, it, we estimate electrical conductivity, and from that we interpret other properties. Um, this is an example along about a 500 meter transect, and we're looking here. Um, the active layer is the very, very thin part of this uh, top profile, which I've expanded down below. Here we see ice wedges, basically, and, and ground ice, and s actually some saline unfrozen part of the permafrost. Um, but we've used this information to estimate things like uh, active layer thickness, uh, moisture content, and compared it with our point measurements, and, and we get really good information. So we've talked about snow, we've talked about active layer, a little bit about permafrost. We've also used another method called seismic, and in particular, um, surface seismic waves to really estimate the deeper permafrost structure. This is really a longer term question. How, how, how um, competent is that deeper permafrost structure and how will it behave in the coming years? And what we found is that 
we can use this to uh, find that in this particular region, which was conceptualized to have very thick, continuous permafrost up in the northern part of the Arctic region, that there's actually pretty big sections, you know, 20 meters or so, where it's actually unsaturated and not frozen due to saline incursion. This is a marine area. So it's really changed our conceptual model of permafrost, and you can imagine here in this region, if we just happen to now, it's not that we need to thaw through uh, you know, 20 to 100 meters of permafrost. Now in this fragile region, if we just thaw through the first couple meters of permafrost, we could have really devastating mass wasting of this region and a variety of carbon cycle issues associated with that. So we've done this work in using these kind of method by method, property by property, to estimate things that are important for understanding terrestrial system behavior in these high latitude systems. But what we really want to do, as I mentioned, is try to develop new methods that, um, we, d that we don't need to use method by method, property by property, that we can really use these all together in, in big steps and understand how the system is structured and how it functions. And so I'm going to talk with you about these two methods that I'm really excited about. The first one is focused on um, what, what we're calling ecosystem zonation or functional zonation. And then another one uh, is focusing on really digging into certain zones that we feel are hot spots in that environment and really watching that system behave over time. So the very first part, the zonation, is that as we're going through these data sets, we realize you know, each of these different types of geophysical data sets could really be used as a proxy for something that we care about that really influences the way that that biology works, whether it's the you know, below ground microbes or, or the above ground vegetation. So active layer thickness, soil moisture, soil temperature, um, the amount of ground ice, for example. And so you know, my conceptual model then was rather than doing this step by step, why not just look at these geophysical attributes um, as, a, as a suite of geophysical attributes and understand if there are certain um, suites of geophysical attributes that spatially clump in the subsurface, if that makes sense, recognizing that these geophysical attributes are proxies for things that we care about. The same time I was very interested in understanding how land surface properties were clustered spatially because remember our original hypothesis was that microtopography in this environment would control hydrology which would control both above and below ground biology. So I used a variety of geophysical data to look at spatial clustering in the subsurface. I used LIDAR based metrics and things extracted from that to understand how the land surface was um, spatially distributed. And I found out for the first time that there was a huge coincidence. First of all, these were did have certain clumps of attributes both above and below ground and that they were spatially coherent. Not surprising, we do expect microtopography to, to control, uh, but this, to control how that behavior or how the, the rest of the system is, is structured. Um, but this is the first time we've had such nice data to be able to see that. And it really opened up kind of our conceptual model of how we can use this data um, to move forward beyond one compartment, one parameter to really get at zones in the environment. So what we did in this site then is um, we took our LIDAR data and we used a, a watershed delineation approach, kind of extended it to estimate polygon, um, well, to delineate polygons in the region. So this is an example of a plan view map of these ice wedge polygons. There's probably about 2,000 of them there. Um, and then what we did is we went back into these areas where I have a lot of very intensive measurements, geophysics and otherwise, including microbiology, and tried to understand in this environment, um, first of all, what is controlling the variabilities of these properties? Is it those trough rim centers, those very small features that you see around every one of those polygons, which, by the way, is the way our, our modelers were going to approach this problem? <laughs> Or can we find regions in this landscape that have unique distributions of property suites that are important for the way that this system functioned? So we went through a series of exercises where we looked at the statistics about the variability of the different properties as a function of, on those two intensive landscapes, as a function of um, whether they were in certain type of polygon, high centered polygon, low centered polygon, flat centered polygon. Remember those are the types that either it's healthy and your ice wedge is there or the ground is inverted. Um, and also, as I'm sorry, this is hard to see, as a function of center, rim, and trough. So we looked at both polygon features and polygon types. And basically this statistical analysis told us, you know, really the thing that was controlling the most of the variability we were seeing across all of these data sets was the polygon type. Not those small scale features, but the larger scale features. 
that's great. That helps us with that scaling. And so what we did then is went back into this, and rather than look at 2,000 polygons, we use this sort of um, information to estimate what we call functional zones in the landscape. Now we're looking at the same plot, um, but rather than have 2,000 different parameters or little blocks that you might have to put in your model, we have basically three. Ignore the yellow, which is a drainage feature coming into this area, but now we basically have a red, green, blue, uh, um, I guess, pixel, if you will. Um, and each of these red, green, blue regions have a unique distribution of properties that are important. So this is an example of blue, green, red, active layer thickness, soil moisture. We can also look at geochemistry, soil temperature, and other properties as well. So this is exciting to us. Um, this says basically that it starts to give a flavor that we can move beyond looking at very local scale, you know, one compartment of the system, one parameter of the system, to really look at how we know the system behaves and that different subsystems within a landscape or within a watershed might be behaving differently. And so this is the first step in really trying to define those functional zones within an ecosystem that now gives us a chance to put these sort of blocks into models at a larger scale together with the probability distributions of parameters that control. But let's take a look to see if this works. So basically we come back into this line right here and this is crossing a low centered polygon, high centered polygon and a transitional polygon. We understand kind of what the parameters are or distributions are in there now. And what I'm showing you is one example of a geophysical transect and of course we get this zo geophysically defined zonation using a variety of different types of geophysical transects, not just this. But if we pull out you know, samples of the microbiology and look at it in the different zones and we do chamber-based measurements along the ground surface that looks at ground flux, flux of CO2 and methane up out of the system, we absolutely see a completely different uh, mi microbiome in these different regions and also a different greenhouse gas signature. So this is a nice, you know, we have to do this in other places and other times and this is where we're at right now in, in trying to extend this, but we think it's a nice approach for trying to move beyond the very, very small scale and start to move these estimates of parameters up to scales that are relevant for parameterizing the larger model. The second main thing that I want to try to convey that I'm pretty excited about is, okay, now once we have this um, ecosystem defined in these zones and we see there might be these hot spots of activity or very different um, suites of properties, how do these different regions in the landscape behave as a function of a perturbation? And so what we've started to do in these regions is develop these sensing networks that um, are basically autonomously now sensing below ground and at above ground sensing. So we have, for example, as is shown here, sorry, let me move forward. As we've shown here, um, we're using electrical resistance tomography kind of laid out in these different hot spots. We're also collecting a lot of soil-based measurements, temperature and, and, and moisture and those sorts of things. At the same time, we're imaging the ground surface, right? And what I'm showing here, we actually have a camera looking at the ground surface, collecting information about in red, green, blue and near infrared, but telling us about you know, time lapse snow and inundation and vegetation growth. These are collecting every day, sometimes twice a day, just streaming in. So we get this beautiful picture of watching the system actually breathe and freeze up and thaw and vegetation growth and all kinds of things happening. And I won't give you too much detail because our data is, is, is really getting extremely enormous. We have a lot of data mining that's going on right now. But we are absolutely finding, and we talked about it a little bit this morning during the lightning um, talks in the eco-hydrology group, we are actually finding these really great correspondences between when we think the you know, near surface starts to thaw and what's still happening below ground, and then when that thaws, what's happening above ground. And that connection, again, not in this case from bedrock to canopy, but from permafrost to canopy, and even a little bit in the top of permafrost also. And we're starting to really see these great dynamic relationships between the soil moisture, active layer, free state, salinity, vegetation, greenness. This is an example, ignore the green line for now, but shows a correlation coefficient between electrical conductivity in the first about half meter and greenness or you know, a measure of, of canopy vegetation um, above ground. So above and below ground parameters and we see that as we get into the growing season, correlation coefficients on the order of 80, 90 percent really saying that you know, they're not surprisingly but there's a strong connection between above ground and below ground and starts to 
push us in the direction of at what point in the year can we you know, use the above ground canopy information as a biosensor of what's happening in the soil, also starts to give us more information about at what time will these soil parameters be influencing above ground. And then we're extending this now. We've been using tight, kite based methods, of course. You know, we're really moving into drone based, based methods. And so I really do see this kind of push in tr terrestrial sensing that is going to be changing extremely rapidly in the next five, 10 years. And I'm really, really excited about that. So, oh, sorry, I don't know what happened there. Um, let me get back into this. <coughs> I just, you know, I'm going to move into very briefly talking about the, uh, the watershed case study uh, that we're, I'm also working on and just very briefly remind of, about some of these same zonation and above and below ground sensing that I just mentioned on the Arctic project. But I mean, some of the main things that we're getting out of the Arctic project just really in the last few years is that the geophysics is, of course, providing not only kind of unprecedented resolution of information, but a lot of insights about how the system is functioning. Um, and we're kind of starting to get to the mode where we can traverse these sort of scales here at the bottom, kind of very local to intermediate. And of course, what we need to do is to get up to climate scales. So um, I want to move back uh, to talking about the watershed problem. So the first one was really looking at ecosystem feedbacks to climate, really focused on respiration due to microbial processes. But another big problem, of course, is understanding how these climate-driven or maybe even just weather-driven perturbations to a watershed changes the way a watershed functions. Watersheds are extremely, um, extremely complicated, as we all know. Um, we have to think about not only the processes that I just mentioned before, permafrost is basically, you know, acts as a hydraulic barrier, but in the watershed we have the, the vegetation, the soils, the vado zone, the capillary fringe, the groundwater, the hyperic zone, the surface waters, a variety of different, you know, interfaces and compartments. And there's been a lot of work done in thinking about ecosystems to, you know, climate, but not a lot of work done about thinking about carbon migration or nutrients um, in, in that part of the subsurface environment. So um, this team that uh, I've been leading on this project, we call it Genomes to Watershed, is really focused on trying to understand can we develop uh, multi-scale uh, simulation approaches that really capture the way that a microbiome functions and evolves with environmental stresses and what difference does that make to predicting larger system behavior. Um, it, it's been really fabulous. I have to say I'm not going to talk about uh, my colleagues' work here, but maybe I can give just um, a brief summary is that we started working at a site called Rifle, Colorado, which is just a floodplain uh, next to the Colorado River. We've done quite a bit of work there for a long time in uranium um, biogeochemistry and have moved in the last few years into nitrogen and carbon. And, you know, this group, including Jill Banfield and Harry Beller and Carl Stiefel and Owen Brody and Tetsu Tokunaga and many others on this team, Ken Williams, have done a fantastic job um, as an ensemble of really understanding uh, the value of genome-informed reaction tra uh, reactive transport models and actually have predicted, um, improved the prediction of carbon export to the river by including metagenomic and metatranscriptomic information that has helped to refine reaction networks. It's found out that this, our study, that there's, you know, a, a fair amount of deeper respiration going on in Vado zone, particularly in the capillary fringe, like we've seen from many of the experiments that are going on here. We've learned quite a bit about the role of hot spots and hot moments in this environment. This is an environment that is dominated by snow melt, delivers, an oxi delivers a kind of an oxygenated pulse of water to the environment. So we use it as a natural laboratory to look at how that subsurface responds to that pulse and try and understand this coupled biology, hydrology. Um, geophysics and geochemistry. We are now moving to a larger side in the upper Colorado River Basin, a headwaters catchment. And here, of course, we need to not only understand that very complicated subsurface system, but really understand the vegetation and how things like earlier snow melt will really change the coupling of that eco-hydrology and what it delivers down gradient and, and other factors as well. So this is a, you know, kind of a, a, a newer push um, to go up to the watershed. And in thinking about that, we've been, um, kind of developing a few different things. Where we've been before is really developing reactive transport models in the age of genomics, and I'll show you some examples of the geophysics that have helped to feed into that. But where we're really going is trying to develop scale adaptive models in a watershed that um, try and recognize that there are, just like I mentioned in, in the Arctic, there are sub compartments within these watersheds 
um, that, let's say if you're in a subalpine versus a floodplain part of that environment, that might have very different uh, reaction rates versus residence times and might behave to a perturbation such as a flood and drought and earlier snow melts in very different ways. And so we're really trying to develop a, a scaling schema and actually a model framework that recognizes these different subsystem contributions to the aggregated watershed response so that we can really in, deliver a, 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 a predictive capability to simulate how that watershed aggregates those responses and delivers water and nutrient um, carbon and contaminants down gradient. Some of our work in the first few years have similarly used geophysics to try and understand you know, hot spots and hot moments. This is an example of using spectral induced polarization in this little floodplain environment here to identify the presence of what we call naturally reduced zones. So this is a, you know, um, a riparian zone where there's floods occasionally that washes fines and, and woody material over bank. It gets buried. This very rich organic material serves as, again, a, a carbon source. Um, and so we mapped these using geophysics and they got put into the model and we you know, could really kind of explore um, how important was the parameterization of these hot spots as well as the hot moment, which was the spring runoff um, into the model in terms of predicting biogeochemical cycles through this floodplain and particularly export out to the Colorado River. We've also been developing, and this is a big part of, of my group, is to develop these inversion frameworks that consider a variety of different things. And here's an example by Feng Tran, a, um, a postdoc working with, with me in our group, in using this time-lapse streaming ERT data together with some other measurements to estimate um, moisture and temperature uh, in that shallow zone of this floodplain environment that's so important to uh, the microbial processes. And so we're in the process of using this sort of data to kind of rapidly assimilate into the models. And I know you can't see this in too much detail, but it really is the first um, inversion approach that coincidentally uh, considers thermal hydrology and electrical um, raw data. So we've done you know, a pretty nice job in the first few years of this project in trying to develop methods and an understanding of certain things, you know, carbon cycling, the subsurface, hot spots, hot moments, what we can get out of the geophysics, how we can build the models. I can say the genome-informed reaction transport models did improve our predictions of biogeochemistry in that floodplain. However, now we're moving up to the upper Colorado River Basin. It's big. Um, and so you know, the idea that we can have very detailed data um, just particularly genomics data in a lot of places or be able to install a lot of wells that are sampling the Vado zone biogeochemistry and so forth is challenging. And so as I said earlier, we've been really trying to think about ways to conceptualize this site um, and so that we can really focus on a few subsystems. So for example, a hill slope or the floodplain environment um, and really zoom into these using adaptive mesh refinement techniques. You can't see that right there. These show grid scales, but be able to telescope into the system where and when we need it to really be able to provide high level resolution, again, only where and when we need it. And when I say where and when, it's so that we can ultimately predict this cumulative aggregated response of the river sh rivershed that includes that hydrology biogeochemistry um, in response to a perturbation. This is our direction. We're just starting to work on this, but I'm excited about it. And we are starting to now take the sort of measurements and approaches that we've been developing um, at Rifle and in the Arctic out to the watershed scale. So we're using a variety of different types of um, ground-based and watershed, I mean, remote sensing data. This is Haruko Wainwright primarily in my group to quantify watershed zonation um, in this area. Based on these sort of maps, this tells us where we need to set up these very intensive above and below ground sort of monitoring approaches. Um, and then with that, of course, we are bringing this and assimilating this into models that can use the weather data, our aerial platforms, below ground measurements, and so forth, and start to really assimilate this into the model to understand and predict how the system is functioning. So that's really all I wanted to communicate to you. We have kind of two projects. And um, one of these is focused on genome to watershed, one is watershed to climate. Um, there's a lot of interesting things going on across both of these projects, and I tried to kind of select a subset of, of, the, of the work that, that I'm most involved in. 
Um, on the geophysics side, I think there's a lot of work to be done, but also very exciting, I think, directions of um, moving beyond one parameter, one compartment to take in a little bit of a holistic look and trying to identify these functional zones in the landscape and then watch bedrock to canopy processes happening across there. And then I just wanted to mention that we have these as well as a few other, you know, very intensive field observatories that have a lot of nice infrastructure and we, of course, welcome collaboration in the lab or in the field. Thank you very much. Yeah, I was very interested by the, uh, the observation at Barrow that essentially your, your permanently frozen layer is relatively thin. Yeah. And below that, it's a saline yes. soil layer. Do you have any idea how, how far that extends inland? No, actually, uh, we've taken our, um, actually, I even have it here. We've taken our measurements from kind of some of our intensive sites um, out towards the marine system in different directions, uh, but only inland some kilometers. It's a really good question, um, and we're, I should say we're also now moving to the Seward um, Peninsula uh, around Nome, Alaska, which is a, um, a, a less continuous and sometimes you know, discontinuous uh, permafrost region, a little bit of a space for time analog, maybe not. There's other variables, topography and bedrock, that'll make a difference there. But I think the permafrost long-term question is really an interesting one. Um, and, I, and most of our NG Arctic project is really kind of focused more on the soil and feedback. But I think you know, there's a lot of work to be done. Um, we and others are starting some of the geomechanical modeling to think about what that permafrost degradation looks like. And I think that kind of there's a frontier here of coupling that geomechanics with the geochemistry and microbiology really to think about, and the hydrology, of course to think about future looks. Um, but yeah, we, we, you know, we are in a peninsula that's surrounded by marine water. There's mar you know, marine spray coming in. So, and we certainly have drilled down here to confirm. Um, and it is, you know, it's, it's briny. Um, so yeah, it's, was, it has suppressed. I was just wondering if you had also kind of horizontal dynamics like in an estuary, basically. We haven't done that. Also with sea level rise, you could have potentially any Absolutely. intrusion of more yeah. seawater. No, we have more work to do on the, perma on the deep permafrost. Uh, hi. I really liked your work on the efforts on bridging skills uh, from meter to landscape skill. And I was wondering, so you showed uh, the image of the aggregates, so are you also working on bridging the skills from the micrometer to a meter scale? Yeah, so not so much. Um, the, I show that Nestle Han Toss is a microbiologist that works in our group. Um, and we have folks that are doing the freeze thaw column, similar to what you're doing with the hydrology and biogeochemistry imposing that. And so, um, so, so sh you know, she is partnering with us very much to look at the biology and how that community changes with freeze thaw and as a function of those gradients in a vertical direction. Um, yeah, by the way, she's, uh, you know, also, um, well, I won't go back to it, but I showed her transect where the microbiology community varied laterally as a function of these geophysically identified functional zones. They also vary fairly significantly vertically as a function of some of the um, zones we can see in the geophysics. So I think there's, you know, just again, another real frontier area is to understand the spatial and temporal variability of the, these communities in the natural environment, right, and, and temporal as well. It's really fun, and I think the geophysical template, I mean, the geological template holds value for, for that. Thank you. Great talk, Suzanne, thanks. Thank you. Um, are you doing any monitoring during this non-growing season in the Arctic or no? For example, for like yeah. CO2 respiration? Yeah, not too much. And we've recognized, I mean, like you, we've seen this spring uh, burp um, where uh, as soon as we can get out there, I mean, it's really hard working conditions, right? It's freezing and it's dark. Um, and so uh, we actually have to take down, we have both chamber-based measurements and eddy flux tower at these sites. And um, the eddy flux tower, we just, we basically break it down. Margaret Torn is the lead of that effort. Um, for the winter. I think, you know, during this last year where we saw, similar to what you're seeing, that as soon as we get this thaw of the very thin layer of ice, we see this big spring burst. 
um, that, and, and from some of our geophysics, you can see that you know, these processes are continuing long after that ice forms. I think our team now is recognizing that we need to do more wintertime measurements. It's just hard to do. Um, but I think it's important really for the whole scientific community to really figure that out because, um, you know, as we're seeing and several others are, that it could be a pretty decent fraction of the annual cycle. Really enjoyed your talk. Uh, yeah. Really loved the ecosystem zonation ideas that you had. Um, one question along that line: Are those zones um, constant for every biogeochemical processes that you're considering, or would there be different zones created for different uh, processes? Yeah, so that's a great question. I mean, I, I think we are considering these functional zones as being suites of properties that are important to the process that we're interested in, and here we're interested in. Uh, soil respiration, right, and fluxes. But when we go into the watershed now, it's a different story, right? We're going to be and are starting to look at um, above and a variety of above and below, you know, so of course slope aspect vegetation, but also soil, water content, bedrock, and things like that. And now we're interested in a variety of different things, you know, residence times, um, you know, uh, different <coughs> biogeochemical cycles in those environments. So, you know, it kind of comes back to your conceptual model about what parameters are, do you think are controlling the processes that are important, and then looking at the data through that lens. Yeah, thanks Thank for so highlighting much. that. One or two more questions? Uh, thanks a lot for your talk. It was great. Um, I have a question about the uh, watershed functions and structure. And uh, as far as I understood, uh, you are trying to get more data and more knowledge about the watershed to constrain the, uh, the, the outcome of further models that you use. What is your main strategy of constraining your models based on the data that you collect? Well, that's a big question. Um, so. Let me say that, um, how do we constrain the model? So in this particular project, and we're just starting this, um, and I mentioned that we're taking, and Car Carl Stiefel and Reed Maxwell are the leads on a component um, called this, this scale adaptive approach that we're using. And what that means is that we can use you know, adaptive mesh refinements to zoom in, not just in resolution, but also in physics where we need to, right? We can kind of change physics in certain areas. So for the first part, we need to have a conceptual model about which subsystems of that environment might be behaving differently. That might be from our watershed zonation aspect, but it could also just be from our knowledge about, you know, life zones or biomes, you know, and, and where, we, where we know there are big fluxes based on other, other types of measurements. Um, so, you know, right now what we're doing is we're building the big watershed model that can have this adaptive mesh refinement capability. Um, but within each of these subcompartments that we've identified as high priority for, you know, spanning that range of residence time and reaction rates, you know, we're also developing submodels. <laughs> so a hill slope model, a floodplain model. Um, and we're thinking about using those as scaling motifs in some way, but within these more localized models, you know, this is where we use a lot of like our geophysics, our isotope data, our, you know, point measurements. I mean, that's where we take this sort of stuff and wind it together and parameterize the model, right? So even at that local scale, we have a lot of developing the model and challenging it with data. And in some of these cases, I mean, I didn't talk very much about the genome-enabled reactive transport model, but, you know, that's a certain type of model where Owen Brody um, and his colleagues basically develop what's called an ecotrait model. So we're saying that the microbial community um, functions as a, as a, behaves as a function of environmental parameters and responds accordingly. So there's feedback between environmental parameters and the evolution and behavior of this microbial community. There's feedbacks, right? So that's kind of an example of coupling an ecotrait model with a more conventional reactive transport model. So in each of these different subsystems, we have some of these model formulations that are quite different. Your parameterization, of course, then would be quite different. In the ecotrait model, we parameterize that with, you know, metagenomic and actually metatranscript 
transcriptomic informed reaction, reactive transport models. But, you know, we might look at a system where if we're looking at how does, this is underlain by Manco Shale, how does Manco Shale re release a lot of the metals that we're interested in under different water or redox conditions, you know, then we'd probably use more conventional like core-based sorption data and that kind of stuff. So, sorry that's a long-winded answer, but, you know, basically we have these sub-models within the larger watershed model, and depending on what processes are involved, you know, we really work at the local scale to, uh, to understand and, and fix those models, then they get embedded within the larger. Okay, thank you very much. One last question. Thank you very much for your talk. Uh, I had a question regarding uh, the geophysical measurements, specifically uh, using them for subsurface imaging at a field scale, <clears throat> but also uh, their quantitative application and sort of bridging the gap between what we do in the lab uh, and yeah. what we do in the field. Um, what could you comment on kind of the methods that you use uh, to develop quantitative uh, measures for like the inversion methods that you use for your IP data, for example? and how you couple those to the bioreactive transport models? Well, um, so uh, we've taken a variety of different approaches um, to, you know, from going from the raw geophysical signature, right, you know, and, and taking it all the way through its inversion and then trying to understand in the laboratory the petrophysical response, you know, similar to some of the work I heard about today, you know, how does, it, for example, the spectral induced polarization respond to gas content versus what's happening at the pore mineral interface, which will be a big, you know, contribution to that. Um, I think for those sorts of measurements, we're still at such an early stage, you absolutely need laboratory experiments, right? Because there's so much ambiguity and it's, and it's an early stage signal. Um, some of the other more, uh, you know, approaches that have been around for a while, and we have a feeling about it like electrical responses to, you know, moisture or salinity. I mean, we can kind of use field-based co-located measurements to help to constrain those. I didn't mention that, um, I mean, most of uh, my approaches and our team's approaches relies on a Bayesian framework for integrating data, um, meaning that, you know, we have different types of data, but we understand their relationships, and so they're basically all honored within this stochastic framework, and so we end up getting estimates of the properties we're interested in, as well as their uncertainty distributions. You know, I think that's been really nice because, you know, you can always say, for example, with geophysical data, you really do trust your well data. It's your direct measurement. It's sparse, but it's direct, you know, and you can compl complement that with your geophysics, which is spatially extensive but indirect. So, you know, in terms of an estimation framework, that has tended, tended to work really, really well for us. Um, but it, it's a combination in terms of the petrophysics, of course, laboratory experiments and co-located field experiments to try and figure that out. Thank you.